Pasamos ahora al siguiente panel. Panel 2, Analyze of European Maritime Safety. And I have the pleasure to, uh, to introduce two persons of the decisions of the, um, uh, of the European Maritime Safety. And I do in English because uh, we, the Galicians, we are multilingual. We speak our language here in the European Parliament, but we speak also other language. Um, I have the pleasure to introduce uh, a representative of the Maritime Safety Unit of the Directorate General for Transport of the European Commission, Mr. Jacob Terling. He was in the responsibility at the time of the prestige. I know you have an historical memory of the accident and of the, all the maritime questions. Um, we thank you also the European Commission to participate uh, with us because on the 3rd December 2002, after the prestige accident, after our intervention as BNG, the intervention of Mr. Nogueira as European deputy, the European Commission published uh, a communication about the reinforcement of uh, maritime safety about the prestige. It's here. I was taken in, the, in seven days after the prestige. Um, the decision of the European Spanish, uh, Spanish uh, government was taken one year later. Um, we want also to, to say that because uh, the European maritime safety and the, all the improves uh, in the legislation was uh, after this special committee of the European Parliament. And I think you put uh, some ideas in, the, in, in one part of the legislation, but we are not sure that the, some member states uh, are taking in place as the Spanish state because they've forgotten a lot of times the, the decision. So uh, many thanks, and you have the floor, please. I, uh, sorry, I, I did the mistake with uh, <laughs> confounding a uh, unquote. Don't, don't worry at all. Thank, thank you. And um, honorable members, uh, Ms. Miranda, thank you very much for inviting the European Commission to, to participate today. Um, allow me to say on a personal note that, indeed, I was around both with Erika and with the prestige and i can say that i feel very much your emotion you were not the only ones having emotion it was also here in brussels some of us had to work with this at the time day and night actually that's the communication referred to and all the legislation and i also wish to say i take my hat off for the bravery and for the heroic work of everybody involved in the follow-up after the prestige and the, the, the chaos that it caused. But I would wish to concentrate with your indulgence today a little bit on what this, actually two, but, but in particular prestige accidents, what we could learn from them. What could we do? Because that was indeed a question. I've heard it from many of the speakers today. What could we do to avoid this to happen again? And I wanted to start with a setting, but that's completely superfluous. You have, couldn't provide a better setting. Uh, so I will go straight into, and I apologize a little bit of the legal and technical parts with this, but it's very important. Uh, because the prestige and the Erika incidents basically formed the European Maritime Safety Policy 20 years ago. It created the momentum, the political momentum for a lot of what we see today. And without jumping the gun and by knock on wood, we have not seen an accident of that magnitude in the European member states waters since then. And, and I think that is something positive. I can't say it won't happen again. Nobody can. Uh, we are doing all in our power and continue to do so to try to avoid this and to be prepared when it happens. So I would like to put it in that context, and I'm very grateful personally as well for you bringing back what for some are hard memories and, and from this tragic accident. 
but it puts actually back on the agenda oil in water. We discuss a lot of environmental things today, but it's mostly, and rightly so, greenhouse gases. But we must not forget that the Green Deal and everything around s s sustainability is also to avoid pollution in water. It's not only in air. And this is an opportunity to remind ourselves of the catastrophic consequences a big oil tanker can have when it goes down. Perhaps, and I don't wish to be provocative, but also to remind ourselves, it is our demand for energy that makes these oil tankers sail. They don't sail for the fun of it. So we must not also forget that. It's our lifestyle that demands energy. I fully listen to the, the, the suggestion that we should phase this out. Probably that will happen. I don't know when. And we will have other types of cargo. But it is a fact of life that we need it to, to, to maintain the life we want to live. Let me go into a little bit of the legislative proposals and what is today law after the prestige. And it was pushed very hard from the parliament, from what we have learned or you have, are well aware of the inquiry and the parliament putting this on top of the agenda, forcing member states to put it on top of the agenda and forcing the commission to put it on top of the agenda. For those of you that remember, the only other thing that was on top of agenda was the mad cow disease in those days. But those were the two main priorities of that commission back in 20 years ago. And that resulted in decisive action. And I have brought what we today have, which is over 60 different pieces of legislation in the maritime safety and environmental protection field below. A lot of this is based on international law, but allow me to say the big difference between the EU context and the international context is that we have a legal order and we have a court of justice, so things happen when a, a, a state does not follow the rules. That's not the case at the international level. That's the main difference. What did we do? There are many, many uh, parts, so I will, in the 15 minutes allocated to me, not be able to go through all, but I will mention and, 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 and maybe pause for a few of them that have also actually been mentioned by previous speakers today. We first accelerated the introduction of double hull tankers in Europe because both Eric and Prestige were single hull tankers. And double hull tankers mean that if you breach the outer hull, still no oil will go into the water. This was very early days. We didn't know if that was actually technically better, but at least for such incidents, of course, the Prestige eventually break, broke in two. Then it doesn't matter if you have single, double, triple, quadruple hulls. If she breaks, she breaks and she will spill. But that was an immediate measure, and we accelerated the timetable that was agreed at international level in Europe. And at the same time, we put proposals, and that means not, not the Commission, all EU member states at the time put proposals into IMO, and the same acceleration took place there for the entire world. And that went through in record time. And we have since been monitoring that. So ba basically, since single hulls were banned, there have been extremely few cases of any single hull sailing in EU member states' waters. And I think as of 2015, there are no single hulls in Europe at all, only double hulls. We accelerated and sharpened the legislation related to, to those that do the technical control of vessels, called classification society. We introduced a very strong regime, the strongest in the world at the time, to, to have independent inspectors looking at their work. And actually we introduced a system which was already introduced back in 1994 when the maritime safety policy started, that only those classification societies that meet the highest quality criteria would be able to work for the EU member states as flag states. No others, because there are, and there was only about 10, 11 out of some 50, 60 different societies out there. And they are still today continuously checked 
that they maintain this quality that we have set and agreed to together with the push of the European Parliament and the Member States in Council of, of a very high safety level, to maintain a high safety level. We also um, introduced sharpening of what we call um, the Vessel Traffic Monitoring Directive. I come back to that, but I want to come to something which is, because I, what I'm talking about now are preventive actions. By sharpening the rules for classification societies, you make sure that the vessel is fit before she goes into sea, before she's sailing with cargo. That is a preventive action. That's why you can prevent these type of actions from happening in the first place. We also have port state control where we check every vessel, not every vessel coming to Europe, but those that we have identified could be critical and, and maybe a substandard, they are checked. We also have flag state rules, which we have now come a little bit later, together with the rules from classification societies, to close the circle so that flag states ensure that, that these rules are followed. And we have laid it down in European law. But we also did something that was mentioned today, and that sits in the Vessel Traffic Monitoring Directive. We introduced rules on places of refuge. Both Erica and Prestige, as you have explained today carefully, were places of refuge situations. And what those rules said is that it is now mandatory since these accidents for each and every member state to have a setup to handle such a situation. And what we introduced is that the decision maker must be independent. It must be based on technical and uh, various input for preferably a single person or a single setup that have the, cap the, the real experience to handle this, to deal with it and take a decision. The decision can be to take her to a place of, re to a place of, of refuge, it can be a port, can be an area, and it can also be further out to sea. That depends on the situation. In order to guide this, we have therefore, together with all member states, in involving parliament, adopted operational guidelines for how to do this work. And they lay down in much more detail what you were asking for, the cooperation of everybody involved. How to also deal with the press, how to not say no, but to say yes, but. And if you can't take the vessel as a, as a port or as a coastal state, you have to explain why. So somebody else could step in and maybe is in a better position to take the vessel so that she is handled and not just pushed away and it's somebody else's problem. That is the rules today. That's what we are trying to do. And just to illustrate, in fact, again with Spain and your coast, we had, that in, I had an incident with what a vessel called Modern Express. It was not an oil tanker. It was a different type of vessel. But the guidelines were applied between the Spanish and the French authorities, and she was, in the end, taken care of and taken into a port and handled appropriately, without any pollution and without any environmental damage, no coastline hurt, no people life lost, nothing. I say this because the willingness of the states to work together and exchange information worked, so it, it has also worked as a practical example. In the event of a spill, because as we have heard, they do still happen, even though they are much smaller today, we have set up a vessel traffic monitoring system it's called the Union Maritime Information and Exchange System. In very short terms, each vessel sailing to or from or along a European coast or port, a European member state coast or port, have to notify if they have dangerous or polluting cargo on board. Why? Because then you are in a much better position to be prepared to take mitigating actions should something start to go wrong. The same legislation then says that the master has to inform as soon as he is in trouble. And that means that you can then start as a state 
to prepare your oil pollution response. Perhaps you, have, you can contain the, the, the oil if it comes out at sea and it never reaches the speeches as was the case in the Prestige. The other thing that happened is that EMSA was created. The first founding regulation of EMSA is from 2002. I was there and it was actually involved in the drafting and it was as a direct consequence of the Eric M. Prestige. Without those two accents, we probably would not have had the Maritime Safety Agency that we have today. And I have a colleague from there. I myself worked there for seven years at the very start of the agency. I have a colleague who will deal with what I just mentioned. Once there is oil in the water, what can be done and how EMSA has been tasked by, by the legislator. That means all the member states and parliament having given them strong tasks to support when there is an oil spill. But I would also come to the situation of a post-event that you were also talking about. Actually, the Eric and the Prestige triggered at international level what we call the Maritime Investigation and Casualty Code, which we have turned into European law. We call it the Accident Investigation Directive. We have broken that out, similar to with places of refuge. So an accident investigation body in Europe has to be independent. They have to not be influenced by anybody but to really look at. But I need to be clear with you here. They are not looking at who may be criminally responsible. They are looking at what went wrong here technically and in operational terms. Because I may say this and I'm not wishing to be provocative, but to go to court and find who may be criminal is one aspect, but it doesn't improve the situation. An accident investigation that can identify what went wrong and we can to take action to avoid that may help improve the situation. That's why we are doing this. All of this is drawn together into the Maritime Safety Agency today. And, and I wish to stop by, in, in my limited time, to just, you may ask yourself, so has it had an effect? Is there added value with all of this? I am, I am part, together with my colleagues, in drafting this legislation, proposing them for this House and for the Member States to adopt. It's still paper. There is nothing unless there is proper implementation. And that's exactly where EMSA comes in and where the Member States authorities comes in. And the movements, everybody concerned comes in, that it produces the effect that we want. In view of this meeting, I looked up what oil spills take place today. And you're right, they haven't stopped. Perhaps a tall order. They are happening, but they are happening at a much lower scale. The international, the, the ITOPF, which is a non-profit organization following and, uh, and helping in oil spills. And they have, you can go on their website, have published some data. And to make it short, we have the lowest level of oil spill worldwide this and last year since a very, very long time. And it has continuously gone down. And Europe has had no, as I said, major oil spill, knock on wood, since these accidents. So in a way, I think we are having a picture. I'm not saying the legislation alone did it. It has been a change of mindsets, a change of culture, also for the shipping industry. There is no tanker operator that gains anything but n bad publicity if they are involved in an oil spill. They are aware today with the social media it can be, you know, absolutely killing for their business. So they have, they, they, they have changed their minds as well. The shipping has slowly come out of the shadows that were maybe more present 20 years ago. More accountable. And we have also done, and I will end with this, what we call, and we are obliged to do every now and then, a maritime fitness check. We have looked at key pieces of legislation with external consultants to see if they are good enough. Are they still fit for purpose? Generally, I can say the outcome was yes. Generally, there was also added value with what we do in Europe, with the European legislation. But, and I will end with this, 
there is no time for complacency here. Maritime safety is continuous improvement. We have more traffic than we had 20 years ago. We have bigger vessel than we have vessels than we had 20 years ago. We have different port and constellations than we had 20 years ago. We have different demands than we had 20 years ago. Oil is still there. Gas is still there. Container vessels are so enormous today that a big oil tanker is small compared. So we are facing continuously new challenges. The whole greenhouse gas issue is, as you know, very well, big. But again, we must not forget that pollution in, water, in water can be equally catastrophic. And we need, we need to maintain our vigilance with the legislation. And that's exactly what we are doing. And to inform this House and, and my colleagues in Parliament, Ms. Miranda, we are going to come out with a package of, of, of further renewed safety legislation. Based on the existing legislation, we are sharpening them where it is necessary further to meet this new situation and new demands. So we are not trying to say that was it, we can sit back and relax and be happy. No, we are actually learned from this that we cannot only react to accidents, we have to be proactive and we will have to try and take action on what we have learned from all the information we have today we didn't have 20 years ago and fine-tune the legislation, and we are hoping for your continued support where necessary and for the encouragement to do that when we come out with it, hopefully in the course of the beginning of next year or the first half of next year. With those words, I wish to thank again for the opportunity. I'm sorry if I was too legal and technical, but this is the framework of the maritime safety policy we have today. It was triggered by this event. And I'm now happy to leave to my colleague from the European Maritime Safety Agency to give you more in-depth from the pollution response that we is an absolute direct consequence of the Erica and Prestige in support of member states' pollution response capabilities. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Frederick Hebert, Head of Sustainability Unit, Sustainability and Technical Assistance Department of the European Maritime Safety Agency. And we have also a message of the director of the agency with the video of the director, first of all. No, it's not this one. It's not this one, it's the, the video of the EMSA. EMSA, but not this one, the other. No, it's not in the pendrive, it's in the other. Other you can put at the final. Yes. Senora Paz, Madame Deli, honorable members of the European Parliament, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for inviting me to take part in this public conference dedicated to discuss the lessons we learned and the experience we have gained in 20 years after one of the most devastating maritime accident in Europe. Unfortunately, I could not join you today in person, but I'm grateful to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to address you through this short message. Let me start by complimenting you for the initiative for organizing such a debate and bringing a maritime safety topic in the focus. Whenever we talk about shipping, we have to bear in mind how indispensable it is for the global and European economy and for our everyday life. We should also bear in mind that shipping is one of the safest and the most environmentally friendly mode of transport. However, We should also be aware that it does not come without risks. The turn of the century was marked by the two major accidents, the sinking of the tanker Erika in December 1999 and the Prestige in November 2002. Their impact on the environment, on community. Senora Paz, Madame Deli, honorable members of the European Parliament, 
ladies and gentlemen. Stephanie, thank you for <laughs> inviting. Good, 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 please. Okay, I give the floor, Mr. Um, Frederick uh, Herbert. Thank you very much uh, for uh, inviting EMSA to participate. I have another po point which I prepared just to give you a, a little bit some, not the video, but the PowerPoint first, please. Yes. So, uh, as uh, my colleague Jacob has said, uh, the uh, Parliament has been quite instrumental in pushing for the creation of uh, the European Maritime Safety Agency. And I will say that uh, uh, this agency has a lot of tasks. Uh, Jacob has uh, described the main uh, pillars of uh, the uh, European Maritime Safety Legislation. And we at EMSA are supporting the implementation of this policy by providing a lot of services. In particular, the, on behalf of the member states, I will say, the uh, inspection to uh, classification societies in order to see if they, are still, if they maintain the standards and also visit to member states for the implementation of several directives to ensure that there is a consistent implementation by all member states of the uh, safety legislation. And uh, to focus now on what is more, I would say, related to uh, this event today, uh, we have been also tasked with uh, the task of providing the member states with additional response capacity. So I try to encompass in a few slides what is our role. And uh, what I would highlight is that definitely uh, this task is the child of the prestige incident. When the first regulation on EMSA was adopted in, 2020, in 2002, the member states were not at that point. Although we have experienced the uh, ERICA, it was quite a huge incident, but member states were not there and they didn't want the agency to have an operational task in particular in a field which is the ultimate responsibility of the member states. So I will say that the prestige has been the, uh, uh, the straw which broke the uh, back of a, of a house. And uh, then we were, we were given this task. This task, it's very delimited in the regulation. We are requested to deliver operational response capacity and taking into account something which is already existing and which is very active all around Europe, which is the regional cooperation. All around Europe, we have several frameworks like the uh, ELCOM, the Bonn Agreement, the Barcelona Convention in the Met, and several other regional agreements where the member states, before crea the creation of the agency, have already the habit of uh, cooperating, in particular when there is uh, a spill. So uh, EMSA is coming, I we say, uh, to support this uh, regional cooperation, and uh, we are trying to provide, on top of what is already available in the region, some additional response. How we have built uh, this uh, uh, capacity, I think that the starting point was exactly uh, the analysis of what has been missing in the two uh, big incidents, the ERICA and the Prestige, and uh, the lessons learned from an operational side at the very beginning in the aftermath of the incident were that uh, we were lacking of uh, large storage capacity at sea, large vessel able to stay longer at sea in the very first day after the spill, when you can still recover a maximum of oil even if you will not, never be able to, re, uh, to, to recover all the oil, but you can at least prevent a lot of it to go uh, along the beaches. And also, uh, these two incidents were, invo were involving some very fuel oil. It was said by the previous speakers, very thick, very difficult. And this has been also a huge limitation in the response operation because the uh, system that we are used at that time were either stuck by the thickness of the oil, either once it was on board, it was so uh, solid that it was quite impossible to take it out of the ship to discharge the vessel. So the need not only to have a big storage capacity, but also strong heating capacity. So these are the main features that we have taken uh, technically on board when we have designed uh, our um, uh, system. Prestige and Erika were not the only incident uh, in that period. Some years after, we had another style of incident, which also raised concern in Europe. It was the uh, Deepwater Horizon uh, Macondo incident, a big offshore spill in the Gulf of Mexico, and it has triggered, I will say, a sort of, uh, I will use the same term, sort of fitness check of what is the situation in Europe with the revision and the adoption of the Offshore Safety Directive, and also a request to EMSA to uh, think about how to adapt our uh, response task to also provide support to member states in case of uh, uh, such a spill. The two points that have been developed is that we have 
started to include some other techniques uh, to uh, deal uh, an oil spill of this magnitude in our, uh, what we call our toolbox. And we have also mm, developed a new service. Next slide, please. So this is an overview of the situation of our response uh, means today. We are currently uh, having set up as a network of, uh, in total, 16 uh, vessels which are all equipped for mechanical recovery, but some of them are also able uh, to uh, use another technique, which is to spray dispersant. Uh, this is mostly, I would say, in the area where there is offshore uh, exploration and exploitation, because this type of uh, uh, response technique is uh, more efficient on very fresh oil, so that's why uh, we have uh, put them in, in these areas. We have also um, developed the concept, and I will come back after on the two, these two main uh, services that we have developed, what we call the equipment assistance service, which are stockpiles of equipment. And we have currently five such stockpiles, uh, as you can see the, the green uh, circles. Uh, we have also, as I said, we have ships which are equipped with, uh, to, dis to spray dispersant. Each of the ship has a small stockpile of dispersant to be able to immediately uh, come into action. But we have also some uh, so other stockpile of uh, dispersant in our uh, equipment assistant uh, stockpile. Some of them, not all, but some. Uh, something I will not deal with today in my presentation, but uh, that I want to, in, uh, to highlight is that we are also supported by the CleanCNet service. CleanCNet is a satellite service which is, I will say, has been designed more to, uh, I will, to try to catch uh, illegal discharge. But, of course, in case of an emergency, and indeed it's uh, one of the services of EMSA which is the most activated uh, currently, in case of uh, either an event of pollution or uh, an authority looking for a vessel which has not given any signal, we uh, use uh, regularly a clean CNET in order to take a satellite image of uh, the zone where the, the ship may be or if there is a, a spill. Uh, one thing I will come later on, on to is that uh, our vessel, for our uh, vessel network, we are little by little equipping them with some additional uh, detection means, and uh, the last improvement is to try to equip them with remotely piloted uh, aircraft system, which are very useful, I will say, when uh, uh, you are on, uh, on a response operation. Next one, please. So, trying to uh, explain a little bit what we have done for the vessel network. Uh, the regulation is very clear. We have to work in a cost-efficient way. That means that it immediately takes out the possibility to have our own fleet of uh, a dedicated response vessel. It's too costly. So what we have done is that we have created a, a model which is based on hiring commercial vessels which are free to operate when there is nothing. But if there is a spill and they are mobilized, they have to be ready within 24 hours with all equipment on board and already, I would say, selling towards the area where uh, they are requested. So it's a sort of dual contract. I would say a peacetime contract, we call that a vessel availability contract, and uh, there is also uh, an incident response contract will, which will be signed by the requesting party and which has already, I would say, all the terms and conditions of the use of a vessel uh, ready. The price, everything is fixed, so no time lost in discussing how it will cost, it's already fixed, they just have to activate it. Lesson learned from the incident, as I said, we looked for uh, high storage capacity. I will say that uh, most of the response vessels that the member states have are less than 1,000 cubic meters uh, storage capacity. And this is quickly rich if you are uh, on response time. So we looked for uh, bigger storage capacity. So average storage is 3,500 cubic meters, but we have some which are nearly 10,000 tons. And uh, uh, with the heating system, we have also decanting system, meaning that we can, little by little, separate the water from the oil, keep only the oil on board the, the ship, and uh, doing like that, we can stay longer uh, in operation. All our ships are equipped for uh, mechan mechanical recovery with two different systems. This is how we say to take into account the quality of the oil that we have to, uh, to combat, and also the meteo uh, conditions. 
And uh, we, I will show on some slides after that some of this equipment. And as I said in the, the pre previous slide, six of these ships are also able to shift a response technique and to stop mechanical recovery, or I will say start by using this percent, and then when the oil becomes a little bit too uh, old, 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 sorry, uh, to uh, go back to um, mechanical recovery. Under the contract that we have, these uh, ships are regularly trained at least once every quarter in live, so at sea, and uh, also, as I mentioned, 12 of them are now uh, equipped, by the end of the year, will be equipped with uh, remotely piloted aircraft system. Next one, please. So, two short slides to show you the type of vessel that you use. We have to, I would say, to adapt to the regional specificities because not always, it's, it's not always easy all over Europe to find suitable vessels. It depends on the trade because uh, we do not, as I said, we do not pay for a full-time charter. We just have what I will call a retainer fee uh, all year long. So it's, how we say, the ship that we are using have another business which fix them in a certain area and they are after that in a position to tender in the framework of EMSA services. So we have tankers, uh, we have also some offshore supply vessels, currently we have only two, and also, I would say in the North Sea, we also have uh, dredgers, because it's a particularity of this area. There are quite a lot of uh, dredging activities, so here we found the dredgers. Next one, please. Type of equipment, each vessel is equipped with what we call sweeping arm, which are these pontoons which are going into the, the water, uh, with two systems of uh, pumping inside. Uh, and they are also equipped with uh, uh, offshore boom and high capacity skimmers. All ship, uh, every ship has also uh, slick uh, detection radars, some of them air pass, and uh, some of them also, as I said, some dispersion spraying system with uh, the tank associated to the to spray. Next one, please. So the second service that I wanted to highlight is the equipment assistance services. Uh, once again, the lesson learned from the Macondo incident. In the Macondo incident, there has been, I will say, a search all around the globe by the U.S. authorities and BP, because uh, under the American law, it was BP who was uh, requested by the authorities to search for the equipment and to find the equipment. And uh, they went all around the, the globe to try to take some equipment to bring it in the Gulf of Mexico. So definitely, we have a need for a lot of standalone equipment to be ready in case of a spill of uh, this type of magnitude. Although uh, the circumstances around Europe are not the same as in the, in the Gulf of Mexico. So that's, uh, that was the origin of this concept of equipment assistance services. Initially, we focused on large offshore equipment, so very large equipment ne which need a very uh, big tugs or supply vessel to be towed and used. And uh, uh, further on, after that, well, we have regular meeting with uh, the member states. The member states are part of the administrative board of the agency, and they are the one to take the decision. Uh, we had some uh, specify, specific uh, discussion about uh, anti-pollution measures, and little by little, they ask us to also move towards medium-sized equipment and also near-shore equipment. So now, all our stockpiles are equipped with three uh, generation of. Uh, uh, different equipment. Next one, please. Once again, some slides to show you the type of equipment that we have. So, uh, on the top left, you, uh, top left, you have uh, big uh, equipment. This is the current but, uh, Buster 6, so this system is uh, 65 meter long, so it's not uh, an easy one to, to tow. Uh, we have also some troll nets for, uh, in particular, uh, in the case of Prestige, this would have been very efficient, and I think that they have been in Vierica also. The same concept have been already used. This one are simply bigger than the one that we are used at the time. Lessons from Macondo, we were also requested to have some uh, fire booms to contain uh, oil and burn it, although it's not a policy which member states uh, favor. But these fire booms, for instance, may be useful if you have a ship burning already to contain around the ship and to, do, to avoid that like, the spill uh, goes uh, further. Uh, high capacity skimmers, so this is the monster in blue with uh, the brushes. Uh, some small portable spraying systems. Uh, the idea is that these are systems which do not need specific installations, so you can put them on any vessel, and then after you put some uh, 
uh, some uh, um, dispersants in, uh, in IBCs, and also, uh, which was requested by the main state, some additional floating storage. So we have some uh, 100 cubic meters of uh, inflatable uh, storage bed. Next one. Medium size equipment. So uh, we have the same type of equipment as the big one, but in a reduced size. So you need a smaller vessel to use them. Uh, some other device which also do not need uh, to have special prefittings. You just take them and clamp them on a fishing vessel, for instance, and you can use it to uh, go and uh, uh, assist in the cleaning operation. And some uh, small skimmers which are going with this uh, uh, V-sweep uh, system, for instance. Next one. And finally, uh, the nearshore equipment. Here we start to have also some working boats which are equipped with some uh, response equipment and which are able to go in very shallow uh, water, so very near from the shore, and with an uh, easy system to um, discharge uh, what has been recovered into uh, bags and some uh, smaller, I would say, storage barges, because usually the, uh, uh, the boats which are going near the shore don't have a storage capacity, so they will need to have uh, this type of uh, additional storage barge in order to once again, uh, be efficient. And the next one, please. We are also uh, thinking about uh, chemicals. Chemicals is another uh, type of intervention. It's not so straightforward, as we say, as oil spill response. Oil spill response is nasty, but chemicals is, are even nastier. So what we have developed here is a 24-hour uh, service. We have developed it in cooperation with the European Chemical uh, Association, CEFIC and the CEDR in France, who is our uh, uh, main contact point. And basically, it's uh, an information service uh, for the member states. In case of a chemical in, uh, spills involving a chemical, they can get immediate access to information on what not to do and what they can do after that. Uh, yes, we can uh, go to, the, I think it's the last one. Next, please. <coughs> And that's it. If you want more information, you have here the, uh, uh, our website where you have all the information regarding our services. Thank you very much. Yeah.